Hello, and welcome to Regrets I've Had a Few. I'm Paul Hunter, Artistic Director of Told by an Idiot, and this is a podcast where I talk to friends and colleagues delving into what made them the person they are today. Hello, and welcome. My guest this month is a director who has forged a powerful creative identity in one of the most exciting spaces in the country. Since becoming Artistic Director of the New Vic Theatre in Newcastle under Lyme in 2007, she has brought unconventional theatrical forms to an audience who have simply lapped them up. Her work has been seen in London's West End and on Broadway, and I'm delighted to say she and her team have collaborated with the idiots on our new version of The Killing of Sister George. Welcome to Reza Hiskins. Hello. It's very nice to be chatting to you in um, in Newcastle under Lyme, where I've been for the last five weeks working with your wonderful team on Sister George, more of that later, and to get to chat more in general really because we've talked a lot but often more specifically about things and this is a really lovely opportunity for me to to find out more about you know what you've made in the past and stuff um but what i always do at the beginning is i tend to take people back to their beginnings in some way and as i was doing my research Teresa, i was struck by something you said when you received your honorary doctorate from the staffordshire university and you said i grew up in a tough london council estate the education I received changed my life. And this struck a chord with me uh, as someone who also grew up in a council household not far away in Birmingham. And uh, I was really intrigued by that. The kind of impact, I suppose, on that education that you kind of referenced. But first of all, early theatre experiences. Can you remember what that might have been? I can remember it really clearly because it, it totally changed my life. So it was the school taking us to see Evita in the West End. And wow. it was that time, do you remember, are you, are you old enough to remember? Yes, um, yes. When uh, Don't Cry For Me Argentina was number one and it was on top of the pops every Thursday night. Absolutely. And we saw that. Wow. And we went to see that live. But you know what, it wasn't, I don't know who it was that was singing it at that point. I don't, I don't think it was Elaine Page or, um, but, um, but that moment where Evita comes out on the balcony and sings that song that we all knew because we were watching it on <laughs> top of the pops every Thursday. Um, but it wasn't her in her amazing white dress that struck me. It was the ensemble. The It seemed like the entire ensemble was on the floor um, underneath the balcony looking up to her. And as she started to sing, they all froze and they were statues for that whole verse. That totally inspired me. And I think I can see that in my work ever since that, that experience. Well, that's the brilliant thing because I remember my brother being a bit older than me. He had a kind of a kind of cast album of Evita with a white sleeve and I could see the black lettering and it had Julie Covington singing Evita but I don't think she ever did it on stage I think it was just an album they released um because I, anyway I, I remember that that obviously that very vividly but what a great who had the vision to take you to see that was that an English teacher or a well, you know what, I, I was so lucky, I think, growing up in London. I mean, although there were lots of downsides to it, you know, you know travelling anywhere was awful, and, and growing up in a London council estate at uh, a time when gangs were starting and people were running guns and drugs and things was, was not pleasant, although enlightening. Um, but one of the great things about growing up in London, even if you had no money, was that there was lots of things open to you. There were the museums and stuff. But when I got a free bus pass, when I started doing my A-levels, suddenly I could go anywhere and if you were really bored and you had nothing else to do, you could at least stay on the bus to the end of the line and then sit there till it came all the way back again. <laughs> but there was all this this theatre. And um, the school would ask mum and dad for, I don't know what it was, a fiver to go to cover bus fares. And, and, and I'd usually throw the letter away, actually. I knew mum and dad couldn't afford it. So rather than cause arguments at home or distress, I'd just chuck the letter in the bin. But what this one time, the teachers must have got sick of me because... You know, there'd always have to be a teacher staying behind from the trip themselves to look after the kids who couldn't or wouldn't go. So I was that kid who kept the teacher behind. The teachers must have got sick of me and said, you're coming this time. So I, I went that time. I was about nine years old, I think. That was my first ever theatre experience. And then I didn't really go again with that school. I, I think it was quite unusual for them to do something like that. Um, but when I left school, that free bus pass got me a lot of places and you could go and stand at the back of the National Theatre for two pounds it was a long stand, three hours, but two quid. <laughs> wow. So as you moved on through school and into secondary school, had that left the mark in such a way that you thought, oh, I'm quite interested in this theatre thing? Or was it? Or was that later when you were standing at the National Theatre that became more of a kind of 
passion or a, or a beginning of a passion? Yeah, I didn't really, wouldn't have thought of it as something to, to do. You know, it just wasn't something that, that I, I had any knowledge about or, or, you know, I was excited about that one experience. But also it was quite prohibitively expensive. Right. And also from the age of about 13, I had a part-time job. I did my O-levels while working 20 hours a week down at the, the sweet shop at the end of, of the road. And, wow. and did that until I went to university. So, you know, that and homework and stuff, there wasn't really much time to do things. But when I started doing A-levels... I wanted to do English and I chose anything that was like English to be the other A-levels. Um, and so I chose theatre studies because I looked a little bit like English. And so that meant you had to go to the theatre in order to do, you know, your, um, you'd have to do an essay on on yeah. something you'd seen. And, um, and that's when I really started going to the theatre and finding, oh, it was fabulous. It was such a lovely amazing thing to do uh, w uh, what sort of what sort of things were you seeing at the national when you were standing at the national during your a-levels what were you seeing i would go to anything whatever was on for me two quid i'd go and see and also the young vic was nearby i loved going to see david all david yeah. backer shakespeare's at the at the young vic and and um uh, uh what else was there nearby there was um there weren't all those fringe theaters that have proliferated now but of course i could i never did because i couldn't afford that but i could have walked into the west end from where i was living at you know the elephant yeah. castle and, and then a bit later down wow. further down the old Kent road so uh, was it any you mentioned david facker at the young vic and was there any particular productions there that stayed with you like all from the national at that time that made you think wow this is exciting how have they done this yeah there was one where um the it, uh, romeo and juliet that he did at the young vic and he, he always did them in the thrust so they, they weren't quite in the round but you know that sense of something quite immersive where the audience is part of the same space as the actors. Um, and the, um, I think it's Deleuze, the front front of house of the young Vic was a bombed out butcher's shop that had been yeah. wrecked in yep. World War II. And so there was a kind of a, a, a thing where you, as you'd walk in, you'd feel a connection with the place that, you know, even if like like me, you were a kid from uh, the, the, the world of non-culture, you knew what a butcher's shop was like. And there was this, uh, and, and it felt quite domestic in its architecture, weirdly. Um, and one night, this one night I went to see Romeo and Juliet, the actor playing the nurse was unwell. So somebody was reading in with the book on stage, not knowing the moves and stuff, just turned up earlier today. To, and I, I guess that was, that's really stayed in my mind. And I guess that was because that was a bit of an insight into process. Yeah. And they used to have um, an artist in rehearsal who would draw rehearsal drawings. And I remember really clearly the exhibition in front of house of um of the rehearsal drawings and being fascinated by what is that thing that goes on to make this thing then? Yeah, that is interesting. And you mentioned the young Vic. I remember obviously not growing up in London, but growing up in Birmingham, coming to to study drama and in London, so I'd sort of eighteen and not really knowing only really getting a view of kind of West End theatre and then going somewhere like the Young Vic felt a really cool place to go seeing kind of and also seeing I think seeing acting really close up I'd never experienced that I'd been to like I've been taken on school trips to Stratford but they seemed miles away when we sat up in the but suddenly seeing I remember seeing a production of Therese Therese Rakan that I think Julia Bardsley did at the Young Vic and this extraordinary Zola story that played out right in front of you and you felt real part of it so when I ultimately the years later got to act at the Young Vic that felt like a real you know, journey for me to go, oh God, this is this amazing theatre and now I'm stood here. So yeah, I can really relate to that. That's so obviously extraordinarily, obviously you must have worked really hard both at the sweet shop and at your uh, academic <laughs> studies because you you uh, you made your way to Oxford, is that right? Yeah, yeah. And um and I started directing a lot there. But in itself sounds extraordinary. That was that was I, I think one of the reasons why I was so grateful for the education I had. I mean, you know, it was free. It was in a sink school for quite a lot of it. It is true, but they took me to the theatre, and the teachers did. Um, they, for some of the the um, the pupils who they felt needed a bit more stretch, they'd, they'd give up their lunch times to do the extra classes and things. So, the 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 education I got there in this school that was, I think, second second to the bottom of the London League tables, it was still really fantastic. And you know what? It all taught me graft as well. Yeah. And that sweet shop where Hansa and Shanti had fled Idi Amin's Uganda and made a life from nothing in this this place. And, you know, they'd get up at five o'clock in the morning and run that place till 10 o'clock at night. And that, again, that sense of if you graft at something 
um, it might be possible to achieve it. That was that was an eye opener. But then um, then I went off somewhere else to do A levels. I yeah. went to Central London College, which was meet meet the middle classes. Can I just say <laughs> before we before we meet the middle classes? Um, uh... I don't often play my podcast to my two children, but what you just said about working in the sweet shop and that cover, I will be relaying this to them very, very clearly. Matt, not just from my mouth, but from yours. Um, now, you mentioned meeting the middle classes, and, um, and I suppose I felt very similar coming from a working class background. My dad was an electrician slash unemployed, and my mum was a dinner lady. And part of the thing arriving at drama school in London was everyone felt incredibly exotic and cultured compared to myself. I can't begin to imagine what it must have felt like for you to end up in Oxford from Elephant and Castle. That must have been a huge change, wasn't it? Do you know what? I think that um, maybe it's the college I went to. I chose, uh, you could choose your college. And in, in fact, I'd chosen, um, I'd chosen Balliol, which is um, very, uh, very socialist college. And I think everybody was pretending not to be rich because it wasn't until I left college. I remember being invited to lunch once after college to somebody's house and it was this split level mezzanine house in Notting Hill. Ah. And I remember just thinking, oh my goodness, this is who you were all along. Whereas they were, you know, wearing secondhand clothes from the charity shop and supporting the miners' strike and and, um, and being, being <laughs> very militant when, when we were at college. And I think also it was interesting because the currency there, I, I, th I think in, in, in a way it's the most um, equal society I've ever lived in because the currency there was academia and also what contribution you were making to the college. So, you know, directing and making plays and things. Um, it, it wasn't in that particular place really about wealth because, as I say, everybody was desperately hiding it, <laughs> only to reveal it the second... <laughs> They left and mum and dad bought them a house. <laughs> that is very, very interesting. And, and funnily enough, a link to Oxford. When we first started Toll by an Idiot 30 years ago, this very year, just before then, a couple of years before, Hayley and I had managed to get our idea together for a show. And we were scrabbling around trying to get somewhere to put it on. And someone, the woman who was in it, young woman who was in it with us, who had been at Oxford, said, oh, I can get us a slot at the Burton Taylor Theatre. I remember meeting various people and obviously the theatre scene was very thriving around in the university. Did you get involved quite heavily, quite quickly in the theatre scene? I did, and sort of by accident, really, because um, I suppose even before going, another amazing teacher during my A-levels had handed out all these leaflets for a playwriting competition. Um, and, um, and I just thought, oh, I'll have a go at that. I like writing stories. I'll enter that. And I went and won a playwriting competition at the Royal Court to have my play made in the theatre upstairs. It ran for four weeks. It was reviewed by all the national press. Oh, my God. Um, I arrived at college in Freshers' Week. with It was press night that week. So on Sunday, all the Sunday papers came out with my reviews in. Oh, my so, <laughs> so I just sort of, just this, you know, if only I'd realised at the time how precious all that was, I didn't. But what I did realise was something that I didn't know was that there was this job called a director because I saw... Um, uh, the, the director, Hetty MacDonald, directing my play and Lindsay Posner was directing another one side by side. Saw them at work and didn't like writing. Thought, this is a lonely thing and everybody expects you to have all the answers. But their job was great. It was working with a group of people and you didn't have to have any answers. You could just say, let's explore that a bit or what do you think? <laughs> And so when well, I got actually, to college, so that's amazing. It was it was totally stunning, and I didn't realise at the time. I just just didn't. But it was so so that was a real professional environment. Max Duffer Clark was running it at the time, and Simon Curtis was there, and they were all involved in this Young Writers Festival that was really special. And um, the amazing Elise Dodgson, who um, later ran the international program, yes. she was running yes, it at so, the time yeah. and mentoring us. And so amazing. And so I landed in Oxford. Um, with uh, with uh, all of that and suddenly started directing shows and uh, what a great environment because you weren't responsible to anybody you just do it you know do what you wanted to yeah but also i imagine you having had a <laughs> arriving and having a play upstairs at the royal court gave you some sort of cachet i imagine amongst your peers your peers at oxford yeah, I, I think it. I think it did. I think it. You know, I did feel myself taken seriously very quickly. I mean, it took a lot of my life after that to feel myself taken seriously again. 
So, you know, felt in this amazing, quite rarefied atmosphere where you go and ask for a little bit of money from one of the drama societies. And, and um, there was ALDS, which was the conventional one, and there was ETC, which was the experimental one, and I joined ETC. That's right, yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. Then there was this thriving comedy scene, of course, as well. Um, and I, when I was thinking about meeting you today, I was thinking, what's my biggest regret? And it was not being part of that, because I was a very serious director. It's taken me a lot of my life to realise that what I like is comedy and humour. <laughs> well, that's an interesting, that's an interesting regret. You know, I mean, it's interesting you bring that up. And if I think of something about your work, as I've encountered it later in your life, I think it's full of comedy and full of that warmth. And I associate, I use that word warmth very, very deliberately, very consciously. Um, which is something that I think is really important. And I think it's something your work really reflects. So it's interesting the journey that we go on, isn't it? As people making theatre, you know, you, it doesn't mean that if you start off necessarily making one thing, you end up doing that or, 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 or drawn or, or not drawn to something else. Um, wow. That's fascinating. So, so um, come out to the university uh, by that stage where you thinking, right, this is it. I want to be a director was, was that forged then in Oxford? Yeah, I was really keen to, and I'd, I'd done a lot at, at college and uh, taken shows, trading Baron Run in Edinburgh season, and won an award at the National Student Drama Festival and things, and, and, and felt that um, that was definitely what I wanted to do. The problem was how you know you come out into a recession, yeah. and the theatre was in recession, and um, I was sleeping on the floor of Manan's council flat. That's where I was living, and I was trying to pay off my debt from college by working as yeah. PA to Sonny Crouch at the London Docklands Development Corporation. I am a brilliant PA, Paul, really fast typist, good at filing. <laughs> um, actually, the great thing about that was I, I earned more than I, I've learned, earned most of my life since, and I could afford to go to the theatre yes, a lot again and sit in seats this time instead of stand at the back. <laughs> <laughs> so there is a benefit to being a fast typist and a good filer. Then. Oh, it was great. They offered me a company car and a pension and a job and everything, and I turned it all down to go and do the RTYDS scheme in Birmingham. I assume that's not one of your other regrets of turning that down, I assume you... No, I mean, sometimes I do think, what would it be like to have a job without loads of responsibility and, and to, you know, be able to carry on going to the theatre as a hobby in the evenings? Because it was fantastic. I used to go like four or five times a week and I don't have the energy to do that now. No, that's for sure. So when you um, went into the regional director school, you, you fetched up at my hometown, my local theatre, yeah. the Birmingham Rep. Who was running Birmingham Rep there when you went? It was John Adams um, and Tony Clark and Gwen De Hughes were there as his associates. But the it was it was fantastic, so exciting. But there wasn't really a culture of independent theatre in Birmingham at that time. Um, the place was just recovering. It was kind of, you know, this post-industrial landscape that was just benefiting from lots of European money to do things like get rid of, do you, know, do you remember the underpasses? You couldn't walk yes, anywhere at I night because there were those dangerous yeah. underpasses. And it had an amazing landscaping as, uh, uh, during that time, during the early 90s when I was there. And it started to develop an independent theatre scene, which is now burgeoning. I mean, I think it's an amazing place now. Yeah, yeah. But then it was quite hard. Yeah, I left Birmingham in 86, so a bit before you were arriving and, and I, I, I didn't go back for a long time, not out of choice or anything. It's just it never happened to go there. And when I returned, probably properly returned, it was when Roxana was running it. And I was in her first production there in the Moliere, the, the Tartuffe. And I remember feeling what a change my home city had gone through. I thought it was extraordinary. I think it's a great city. And obviously, I'm from there, so it means a lot to me. But I think the change culturally has been extraordinary. I agree. Were there any productions that did you get to direct a sort of much, many shows while you were on the scheme, or how did it work? Yeah, I was doing. I did a. Um, I did a turn of the screw in the studio that I really loved doing. Oh, I, I love. Yeah, I love that book. So you did a, a, an adaptation of the of the Henry James. Yeah, yeah. I worked with a commissioned a writer to adapt it, um, Eve Lewis, who later went on to work for Shunt, and also started working. I suppose then I started working with the people that I should have been working with when I was at college, the people who'd uh, done things like the uh, Lecoq and Goliath and courses and things yeah, like yeah. that. Um, and I suppose that's where I first started to find that this very serious person, I, I, I mean, I mean Turn and Screw is serious, but that kind of approach that's more about complicity and playfulness and, and, um, and less about uh, rigorous literary analysis. And that 
but that's where I think I started to find out what kind of director I am. It still took me another 20 years to get there. But um, but that was really exciting to do that in the studio. So yeah. again, that sense of a very, it's, it's quite accessible, isn't it? Like you outlined earlier, when you feel there's an audience member up close and part of the action, it's a very accessible way to see theatre rather than observing it from a distance. And um, we converted the studio so it was on two sides there. And they did quite a lot of community touring work and did a lot a lot with the education team and really started to find a passion for things like directing youth theatre, which I carried on doing a lot of. And, and in fact, for a while, that was my career working in community and education settings, which was really inspiring. And, yeah, definitely. And also get to work with massive casts when you work with youth theatres, which is really exciting as a director. Yeah, you could you can return back to your days of Evita with the big chorus. <laughs> and the, exactly. We come full circle. So when did Pentabus come about? Was that after Birmingham? Um, yeah, so I did. Uh, so at Birmingham, there was this thing going on of these these um, this education work, but also I, I was working with um, an independent company called Jade that was uh, had been founded by one of those actors in turn of the screw who asked me to come and okay. direct their first project. So again, we commissioned a writer, Sarah Woods, to do this thing um, that was called Grace which was, I mean, I'm 30 by now. It's, we've, it's, uh, there's a lot of poverty over the, over the 20s, <laughs> a recession in theatre, and I, I carried on working as a PA from time to time as well. But about 30, we were doing this play that was kind of about being 30, about all your lists of things that are still to be done. And this TV programme called Ali McBeal came out at the same time, which was the same thing. So suddenly we were right on the zeitgeist. And um, we went to the King's Head and we extended and we went to Edinburgh and we were nominated for the Total Theatre Award and the Channel 4 Comedy Award. If only the League of Gentlemen hadn't been there that oh, year, oh. we were second to the League of Gentlemen. And again, that's where I started to discover how much I like fun and comedy and how it can be serious. You know, comedy can, as as, as you always say, it, it, it has, it, it can accommodate serious themes and ideas and really important work. Just because it's funny doesn't doesn't mean that it's frivolous necessarily. You know, I wholly concur with that view, and partly why we're doing plays like doing versions of things like Killing of Sister George and your wonderful theatre, is it deals with just as you say, it, in some ways, it it reveals things much sharply than uh, through the comedy. Yeah. Well, it's no bad thing, you know, coming second to the brilliant League of Gentlemen. So that's the, that in itself is a is a is a feat. Um, <laughs> Before you went, did you want to run a company or was it the beginning to think about trying to run a building? Where, where was that coming? No, I wanted to make new work. I wanted to work with writers specifically and, and particularly a particular kind of arena of work, which was um, about physical visual theatre um, combining with, with new writing. At that point, there was a real um, uh, uh, passion for, across the theatre industry, improvised and devised work which was really exciting and often very physical and very visual, but not always with very strong narrative architecture. And I was really excited by all of that, but I wanted to bring what I'd learned from new writing and the importance of narrative architecture to that world of physical visual theatre. And um, with Grace that we were just talking about, I remember Lynn Gardner saying it was like uh, improvised jazz. It wasn't. It was actually every moment of it was scripted by a playwright who was in the room all of the time. But it did have that feel that very lively feel and that's what took me to Pentabus really that was my next step that that I could see there was a company that didn't think of itself as a new writing company but was a new writing company was commissioning writers to do two plays a year and that there was an opportunity there to make work and also shape a vision and I I hoped um connect with audiences although actually Alan as with a touring company that's quite difficult mm. because you don't have a direct relationship with those audiences you have it with a promoter or a key holder of some kind. Um, but it was a really exciting time. Now, I went and lived, you know, out in the countryside. I'd, I'd grown up with just a balcony outside the door, <laughs> and suddenly there was all this... And I thought countryside was a bit scary, you know, red in tooth and claw. No one can hear you scream out there. Um, <laughs> but I lived in the countryside, and, and Pentabus is based on a farmyard. Um, so you'd go into work in the morning, past the lambs, and you know, sit in the meadow to read script. I think we're cut. We are cut from similar cloth because I, <laughs> I grew up, as I said, in Birmingham, and then came to London. I was always very suspicious, a bit like you, of the countryside, wary of it. And when I met my partner, she was working at the Royal Exchange and living in Hebden Bridge, uh, and um, we we were very early on in our relationship. And I, I went up to stay, and she had to go to work, so I woke up alone in this 
underdwelling in Hebden Bridge. And it literally would feel like that film Misery where James Carr gets his legs broke by the writer. I thought, <laughs> where am I? And, but now I I still live in London and I love London, but I've grown to love the countryside, much to my family's amusement. I always didn't see the point of going for a walk unless you were walking for a reason to get somewhere. So, But now I walk just walk in the country, which is obviously very good. Um, so when the new Vic job came up, were you already looking to try and move to a building or was this just something you thought, I'm going to go for this? No, I was really happy at Pentabus, actually. We'd been just doing, we'd done a co-production with the National Theatre and one was Radio 4 and one with Soho Theatre in London. And it was, there was really exciting. We were, we were just about to do our first British Council tour as well. So it was a really exciting time um, having got the company to that. But then I was asked to apply for this job. And to be honest, my first response was, I don't really want to run a building. That that experience in Birmingham during a recession was that buildings are difficult. Um, it's, it's, it's challenging to keep staff happy. It's challenging to make good work. Um, but, um, but I don't know, as, as, the, as the recruitment process went on, they, they did a very thorough, very good recruitment process, um, which was brilliant, really. It wasn't just about, you know, lagging your way charismatically into persuading people that, that you can persuade people to do things. It, it was actually about demonstrating what your vision is and, and what you might do and chance to formulate that as well. So it was great. So I came to see a lot here. And of course, the space is just yeah, amazing, yeah. isn't it? it uh, is, the architecture it is. of the whole building is extraordinary. Yeah. The, um, the architect worked with the then artistic director, Peter Cheeseman, and also with the then resident designer, Alison Chitty. And you can really see that the building was created by people who know theatre and know yeah. audiences and know about totally, totally agree. Totally agree. And I think that's one of the many things that makes it quite unique. And as a theatre maker and as a first time director here, that I, I it's unlike anywhere that I've kind of worked for that reason, you know. Um, so you get the job um, and now you're running a building. Um, as someone who's never run a building and is always running a company, as you say, it's a very different thing. You know, you're able to be, of course, there's responsibility, but you're able to be very fleet of foot in terms of where you have a small team, all of that stuff. So when you rock up on your first day running a building, is that not terribly nerve wracking when you're suddenly, oh my gosh, I'm responsible for all of this? Not, not solely, obviously, but you know. Yeah, it was. The managing director at the time, Nick Jones, very experienced. Um, so that was that was brilliant. Felt, felt very secure there, really. And because they'd done it all properly, they made sure that there was a really good, what was it, a four or five month handover period with okay. the previous artistic director, Gwenda Hughes. Um, so um, so she, I kind of shadowed her for a bit and then she kind of faded out very tactfully. So, so it felt like a really secure, it was a really brilliant process, actually, to put that in place. Um, and um, so weirdly, it didn't. One thing did feel frightening, which is suddenly, the first play I was doing was a play that had come off the shelf. It was in a published book. It's the first I time I didn't. I was doing a play that wasn't on A4 sheets of paper that would change every day. Um, so for the very first time in my life, doing something that somebody else had already ironed all the wrinkles out of and yeah. knew it could work. Um, although, and and carried on doing that for a bit. But the two things. Apart from that striking, gosh, we're doing plays that have been published. Um, that sense of a connection with the audience was really powerful. And I learned that the reason I've been appointed was because of my background. I had a real natural connection with an audience in what is um, Mirror Group, concluded as the most working class city in the country. Um, and a real sense of what would appeal to people. And also, I think because the work I make is... I try to make it accessible and often non-literary that it, that that it's serious and sophisticated, but that it is also very very accessible to a family, for example, all ages. It it really seemed to chime. It was it was a really fantastic first season actually. I did Jamaica in as part of it, oh. um, and and a very quite physical and visual production of it. And people were so inspired and excited by that. And I learned that they had never heard of promenade theatre or immersive theatre, and and you know that because there isn't a, there wasn't at that time a lot of other theatre around here to see. Yeah. Um, people weren't getting to see the kind of new fashions in theatre presentation and style. So I sort of set about finding ways that I could uh, introduce people to that in this in this um, 
fairly unconventional, but quite large, a middle scale, it's a 600 seater theater in the round. Um, you can't do anything with it other than have it in the round. Um, so it's got a very strong personality. You can't do easily a piece of promenade theater or, or something immersive, but you can find ways to. And we also started off a relationship with a, um, a circus company, Upswing, to put contemporary circus based theatre in there, which has continued in a really, um, really inspiring well, way. Well, it is inspiring to hear you, and obviously I've heard it in some ways when we chatted in the past, but to hear you put it like that and the journey that you've gone on at the New Vic, it is inspiring. And I, it's interesting you talk, you, you, a thread that's gone through all of this conversation is, is writing, you know, from you you having your play on it upstairs at the Royal Court and, and writing in general, because obviously I also think of you as someone who adapts a lot of the work that you do as well. So it's not just that you're directing it, you're also, and I think some of the ways you've managed to take, as you said, stories that can have a very wide appeal, but also adapt them and direct them in such a way that they're still exciting and unpredictable and challenging for an audience. So shows like, you know, that I've seen like Around the World in 80 Days and, and Wicked Lady and, and, and I, I, I just wonder, I have a question about this because we're often, we, we don't adapt in the same way, but we're often inspired by something that we, then brings us to something else. When you're adapting stuff, do you deliberately shy away from seeing that in any other form? So, for, in, for instance, with Wicked Lady, did you watch the James Mason, Margaret Lockwood film? No. So, so actually, Wicked Lady was Bryony Lavery's adaptation. Of course it was Bryony, yes. Loved, loved yes. working with her. And and Around the World in 80 Days was Laura Easton's. Sorry, um, I don't... But I think I'm so, that the, Assuming they're yours. No, they're two brilliant writers as well that you were. No, the, the productions, I think that there's a lot of there's a lot of commonality with those and with the other productions of things that I have adapted. Oh. So I, I, people often think that they're, they're mine and I'm always at pains to credit the writer because <laughs> writers are so valuable and, and, and um, important, aren't they? But, um, but no, I'll always... Directing it or writing, I'll always try to steer clear. Because even if you're not influenced by it, I just don't trust that that brilliant idea I've had hasn't been influenced subliminally yeah, yeah, in yeah, some yeah. way. Yeah. So I just really try hard not to. And then afterwards, it takes me a long time to get, get around, around to seeing it. Um, what was it? I did last year, Tom, Dick and Harry, which was a story about The Great Escape. Yeah. I was literally the only person on the team who hadn't seen The Great Escape, which was really valuable because I was the only person. I think that's really crucial. I remember when we made Casanova a few years ago, Caroline Dossi and Haley. We turned Castellar into a woman, and Haley played it. And Haley knew Venice very, very well, and uh, Carol Ann knew very, Venice very well, and which where much of our story was set. And I'd never been; I only knew Venice from one of my favourite movies, *Dungeon Man*, <laughs> Nick Rome. And I thought, um, I thought, oh, should I go to Venice? So I, and I thought, actually, no. It's really good that one of us only has Venice in our imagination. So I have an imaginative view of Venice, but the other two had a. And I think that sometimes that's really important that you don't know the material. You don't know, you know, when I directed Beauty Queen of Lanan, I, I thought I don't need to go to this particular part of Ireland. I should just respond imaginatively to what Martin McDonough's written. You know, it's interesting. Do you have any, um, is there one project still you think I really, really need to do or want to do this at the New Vic? Is there some idea that's, Oh. burning away for years that you've not managed to do or, and you don't need to answer that if it's no under wraps or there anything. is and it's it's sort of under wraps but um for 20 years i wanted to do angela carter's company of wolves um i was i tried so hard to and never found the right and um finally uh at the new vic in 2000 we planned it and uh, we had an international cast because working with vicky and circus uh, co-director on the show um, to create this amazing, vibrant, very physical, very circusy, circus theatre spoken word fusion. And um, the cast were all due to turn up next week from Singapore and uh, New York and Australia and Denmark. Um, and then um, we heard that all international flights were stopping during oh, due to this thing on. called COVID. And then um, so we had to postpone it. And then a week later, lockdown came. So and 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 um and we for the, we it's one of the projects we've done all our post pre pandemic projects now Tom Dick and Harry yeah. and marvelous all the ones that were lined up before but that's the one that we haven't managed to do partly because international travel yeah. still seemed a little a little bit um unreliable for quite some time 
So that's the one. I'm really hoping. Well, we've got the set. We had it made. It was all designed. Wow. <laughs> um, well, I, was I have to say, knowing your work, the, I, I would love to see that. I think the combination of you and Angela Carter, that particular, uh, again, strangely enough, I remember the, the film, Neil Jordan film in the early 90s, I think. But And also seeing that play out in the, in this, the amazing space of the new Vic, the way you described it, I really, really hope um, I'm sitting there watching that at some point soon. Uh, Teresa, it's been so lovely chatting to you, hearing about your career. It's extraordinary. I, uh, so thank you so much. I always finish by asking seven quick fire questions to my guests. You just have to say the first answer that comes in your head. There's no pressure. So I'm starting off with something connected to the region of uh, where we are. Um, uh, if you had to choose between these two writers, Arnold Bennett or Robbie Williams? Oh, Robbie Williams. Canal boat or caravan? Canal boat. I lived on one when I came here for the first eight months. Oh, how actually I'll have, I'll have to find out more about that. Um, the Amalfi Coast or the Norwegian Fjords? Oh, gosh. Both. Staffordshire oatcake or Cornish pasty? Oatcakes. Kate Bush or Joni Mitchell? Kate Bush. <laughs> directing or writing? Oh, I can't choose there. No, directing I would choose. Retirement or never leave show business? Oh, God. I, I'll never be able to afford to retire, Paul, so the only option <laughs> is to carry on. <laughs> I've, I've heard that many times. <laughs> Teresa, thank you so much. Um, and thank you so much for joining us. You've been a wonderful guest. Have a good day. Thank you. Dear listeners, if you've enjoyed this idiot podcast, please spread the word 